Hi, and welcome to Behavior-Based Safety Observation Training. If you were asked, why is safety important to you? Your initial reaction may be that you don't want to get hurt. Who does? But if you really think about it, what would happen if you got hurt and couldn't come to work? Do you have enough in savings to cover all your current bills, plus the possible doctor bills and prescriptions? Who would do the things around the house that you normally do? Would you be able to spend time with your friends and family in the same capacity that you do now? Even worse, what if you got hurt and never came home? Odds are, the answers to these questions are the real reasons why safety is important to you. Many safety professionals believe that over 90% of injuries are caused by unsafe behaviors. Statistically, safe attitudes result in accident prevention. Safe attitudes also result in safe behaviors at work. We want to develop and improve safe attitudes toward work. We want to eliminate workplace injuries and illnesses where possible. Where we can't eliminate those injuries and illnesses, we want to reduce them where possible. We will also discuss our local safety policy, supervisor and employee responsibilities, and the concepts of behavior-based safety. There's no one single solution to a safe workplace. It's programs, like our monthly safety trainings, hearing conservation, lockout tagout, and this behavior-based safety program. It's caring, caring not only about your own safety, but about the safety of those around you, those on different shifts, and those in other departments. It's accountability, and we're not talking about disciplinary accountability. This is about ownership or responsibility. The accountable employee has the ability and willingness to respond to an observed hazard or at-risk behavior with the mindset of fixing or removing the hazard if able to, or stopping the at-risk behavior before an accident or injury occurs. It's leadership. We should all think of ourselves as safety leaders and lead by example, whether we're working beside 20-year veterans or new employees. It's employees because you and your coworkers are the ones making safety decisions on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute basis. Individually, each piece only solves a portion of the problem. But when all the pieces are put together, we can see the bigger picture. Programs, accountability, employees, leadership, and caring all have their roles in a safe workplace. If any one of them is neglected, we're increasing the risk of an accident Behavior-based safety is a safety management system that specifies exactly which behaviors are required from each employee. These behaviors are geared toward a safer work environment. The system must have controls in place, which will measure whether or not these behaviors exist as a routine element in the work environment. Acceptable behaviors must be positively reinforced frequently and immediately as the behavior occurs. Lastly, BBS is never intended to be used as a hammer or disciplinary tool. We want to understand why unsafe behaviors are happening and how we can agree to change those behaviors. What is behavior-based safety or BBS? A good program will improve quality, maintain a healthier workforce, reduce injury and illness rates, reduce workers' compensation costs, and elevate safety to a higher level of awareness. A behavior-based safety program requires dedication, personal interest, ownership, and managerial and employee commitment. Manager and supervisor roles include a strong management commitment towards maintaining and improving behavioral safety witnessed in regular acts of individuals at management levels. Respectful, trusting, open communication between management and employee groups about all aspects of safety in the workplace. An open, feedback-rich culture among employees, which enables employees to consistently learn and grow. A commitment to improving the profile of and attitude toward health and safety and increase employee engagement and safety. An emphasis on safe and unsafe behavior not a sole dependence on lagging indicators such as safety statistics. A strong, consistent, timely reaction to the discovery of unsafe acts, whether they result in an injury or not. Safety incidents are viewed as an opportunity to learn and improve. Generally transparent and fair leadership from all, including managers, supervisors, and owners.
And here are the rules for employees. Individuals hold safety as a core value, not just a priority. Individuals take responsibility for the safety of their coworkers in addition to themselves. And all level of employees are willing and able to act on their sense of responsibility. They can go beyond the call of duty. Here are some factors that could contribute to an accident. Is the employee trained to do the task or use the equipment? Does the employee know not to use something if it isn't working properly or they are not authorized to use it? Are they reminded not to use it? Why did or why does the supervisor allow the employee to use it? Does the supervisor examine the job first? Why was the equipment not found to be defective before an accident occurred? Are procedures in place for what to do when finding defective equipment? Here are some behaviors that cause accidents. Improper attitude. Desire to please the boss. Lack of knowledge or skill. Physical or mental impairment. Horseplay. Defeating safety devices. Failure to secure or warn. Operating without authority. Working on moving equipment. Unsafe position or posture. Failure to use personal protective equipment. Or the failure to use personal protective equipment correctly so that it will be effective. And here are some unsafe conditions that could cause an accident. Improper PPE, tools, or guarding. Poor housekeeping. Improper maintenance. Improper ventilation. Defective equipment. Unsafe dress or apparel. Hazardous arrangement. So why do we commit unsafe acts when we know better? It's not like we come to work every day hoping to come home with an injury. The ABCs of safety are the reason, the antecedent, behavior, and consequence. The antecedent is the trigger, the thing that causes us to do something. The antecedent causes a thought, an idea that we act on, the behavior. The consequence happens as a result of our behavior. Sometimes the consequence is immediate. Sometimes it happens days, weeks, months, even years after the behavior. Something triggers each of our responses and behaviors. It may be a stoplight or a McDonald's sign, but something triggers us to do what we do. However, what drives us most are the consequences of our actions or inactions. The consequences are much more powerful than the triggers when it comes to our behavior. The consequences have more influence because they are directly tied to what we do, while the antecedents, the triggers, are indirect. They predict how we are going to act because they trigger the reaction. The consequence is so important in our behavior because it drives us. When we behave in a certain way and the consequence is immediate, certain, and positive, we tend to do it over and over. Imagine someone handing you a $100 bill the very moment you behaved a certain way. Even if the behavior wasn't the most appropriate, you might do it again if given the chance. We respond to a trigger with the behavior that gets us the reward right now. On the contrary, the consequences that are further down the road, especially those with a negative outcome, have the least amount of influence on how we behave. This delay between the behavior and the consequence makes it harder for our unconscious mind to link the consequence to the behavior. We like instant gratification, don't we? We all want what we want, and we want it right now. And while those things that are painful, without certain outcome, and pay off down the road may be the best for us, we often don't choose them over the soon, certain, and obviously positive. Here are some examples of how the consequences drive our behaviors. Let's start with saving for retirement. Well, when you're young, you can tell yourself that I have plenty of time to save for retirement. Sure, it's a positive thing, but we all know that the stock market goes up and down, and what if I lose all the money I save before I retire? It's a great idea, but I really want that new phone, those new shoes, or a new car, right now. Upgrades always feel good to get. Who doesn't like a little retail therapy? Or what about speeding? Ever sped because you were late for something? Obviously, driving over the speed limit has a pretty good chance of getting me there on time, soon. Which means I won't get in trouble with the boss, certain, and I'll get to keep my job, positive.
On the other hand, I may get a ticket, which is a real possibility. But maybe the cops aren't out today. If I do get a ticket, I'll be late and out the price of a ticket. Or I could get in a wreck. However, the argument against speeding is still weaker. Have you ever met anyone who got pulled over for speeding and vowed to never ever speed again? Lastly, how about going on a diet? There are lots of really good reasons to go on a diet, but guess what? Most of those outcomes are down the road, and what if I fail to lose weight because of my thyroid, or my metabolism, or my weak will? I do really love those sweets and carbs. They make me feel better when I'm having a bad day, almost instantly. However, my waist size is growing, and if I keep it up, I'm going to have to buy new clothes someday. As the observer, we have to seek to understand the consequence that's driving the behavior. Remember, it's those consequences that are soon, certain, and positive that have the most influence. It may not have all three, but if two are present, you can bet there's a strong pull toward that behavior. Lastly, don't be judgmental when probing to understand what's driving the behavior. Just make sure you understand it, and then you can work on alternatives that have a stronger consequence than those that are present. Once we notice an employee performing in an unsafe manner, it's our responsibility to advise the employee of the unsafe operation. However, interacting with the employee is critical to ensure the behavior is identified and changed. Our goal should be to change the behavior, and focusing on effective communication is key to ensure we don't create an adversarial situation with the individual we are attempting to help. The first step is observation. We are familiar with a process or procedure and notice that an employee is not performing in a safe manner. We must first approach the employee. Doing so means we don't further distract or jeopardize their safety. Therefore, if possible, ensure the area is safe and the employee is not distracted and is aware you wish to meet with them. Further, assure the work area around you is safe and secure. This includes ensuring all processes are shut down and the area is free of any hazardous traffic. Next, we wish to interact with the employee. The emphasis should not be on telling the employee, but first asking questions to try to understand. Practice your active listening skills and gain an understanding. Introduce yourself to the employee and ask them to introduce themselves and the work they are performing. Ask them to tell you about the procedure and the emphasis on safe operating procedures. If possible, ask the employee to demonstrate the proper and safe procedure for the work being performed. Repeat it to them and ask them if you understand correctly. Cite the specific unsafe observation you noticed in their work and ask if they are aware. Ask the employee if they believe this could be hazardous and identify any other hazards. Ask the employee why they chose to operate in this manner and possibly ignore the safety procedures. If you are aware of the safe operating procedures, demonstrate them for the employee. Have the employee demonstrate or perform this for you. Agree on how the employee will perform the task in the future and then ask them to commit to this. If corrections or adjustments to the process or equipment is necessary, make those before further work begins. What should I do if I observe someone breaking a cardinal rule during an observation? First and foremost, stop the employee immediately as they have placed themselves in immediate danger. Make sure they understand what the cardinal rule is and why you have stopped them. Agree on the proper method for performing the task. Report the incident to your supervisor. Our first case study is about a new employee operating a forklift without training or authorization. Bob Jones, the operations manager, has entered the operating facility and observes Jason Raines loading stacks of finished product onto a truck for delivery. The truck is outside the facility, requiring Jason to use the forklift and take materials out of the facility to the loading area. The door to the loading area is roughly 9 feet wide and 10 feet high. Production and delivery are ahead of schedule, and the load Jason is working on is not scheduled to leave the facility for two days. Bob notices Jason is operating the forklift at an excessively high rate of speed, not following the established path for forklifts, and is raising the lift over five feet from the ground while delivering each load. Let's review Bob's approach to Jason. Bob, 
who first needs to ensure he does not distract Jason and the area is safe from any further hazards, gets Jason's attention and motions for him. Hi, I'm Bob Jones, the operations manager. Hi, I'm Jason Rains. I am a new temporary. I started working as an operator's helper yesterday. Nice to meet you, Jason. I noticed you're loading one of our trucks for second day delivery. Yes, I am. Jason, will you please describe the work you're doing and the proper procedures for operating a forklift in our facility? Well, actually, I'm an operator's helper. I noticed the truck needed loading and the stacks of product were in the finished goods area, so I decided to assist with loading. I have extensive experience operating a forklift from my uncle's industrial supply company and recognize the importance of getting orders to the customer. Do you have forklift experience? Yes, sir. I operated a forklift while he was on vacation. Jason, are you familiar with safe operating procedures? Have you ever received forklift operator training? Yes, sir. I never had an accident and always get product on the truck quickly. All of my training is OJT, none of this classroom stuff. Jason, will you walk the facility with me? Yes, sir. Jason, do you see these yellow lines? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with why they exist? Nope. I guess decoration. Jason, these lines are a path for the forklift and are meant to show the employees where they are to avoid accidents. Have you been operating within those areas? Not at all. It's faster to drive the forklift in a straight line. Jason, let's look at another area of the facility. Do you see this door? Yes, sir, the biggest one I have ever seen. Jason, did you know the height of this door is 10 feet? I knew it was high. Jason, do you know the distance you're supposed to lift the forks off the ground when traveling? Nope. No more than seven inches. This should be enough room to clear any hazards. How high do you think you were lifting? No idea. Jason, I saw you traveling with the lift elevated over five feet. Do you think this is unsafe? Do you believe you could drive through the 10 foot door with your load lifted only seven inches off the ground? Yes, sir. Jason, how fast do you think you were operating the vehicle? As fast as it would go. At what rate of speed do you think we limit operators in the facility? No idea. I did not notice any speed limit signs. Well, Jason, our speed limit in the facility is five miles an hour, and that must be adhered to at all times. Wow. Jason, are you familiar with forklift training requirements in our facility? Nope. Well, we require all of our forklift operators to participate in 40 hours of forklift operator safety training conducted by a forklift training company. I guess I'm not qualified. Well, after our review, what improvements and changes do you believe are necessary? First, I need to participate in forklift training. Second, I need to follow the forklift path. Third, I need to observe proper speed limits and not exceed five miles per hour. Last, I need to ensure I don't operate a forklift in motion when the forks are more than seven inches off the ground. So that I am clear, you need to first complete the training and apprentice program. Second, become a forklift operator and adhere to all safe operating procedures, which include the forklift path, safe speed, and lifting no more than seven inches off the ground when traveling. Here are a few things to think about. How did Bob approach Jason? How did Bob interact with Jason? How did Bob ensure Jason understood the proper procedure? How did Bob ensure he understood what Jason was telling him and clarify for understanding? Next, we have a case study on a trip hazard that was ignored. Sam McGuire, a lead operator in the operating facility, is inspecting the extrusion line in the middle of the first shift. He notices in line three, an electrical cable is seen lying freely in the area workers walk multiple times during the production process. Jim Simpson is required to walk down the extrusion line multiple times to ensure the process is completed correctly and is observed stepping over the line while he completes the process. Jim, a 23-year employee and no stranger to safety incidents, continues to complete the tasks assigned to him and seems oblivious to the electrical cable passing through the area today. He continues on with these duties, walking the extrusion line and each time steps over the cable. Sam is at the front of the line observing Jim's work. 
and intends to visit with Jim about this trip hazard. Let's observe Sam's approach with Jim. Sam first needs to ensure he does not distract Jim and that the area is safe from any further hazards. He gets Jim's attention and motions for him. Hi, I'm Sam McGuire, the lead operator in the facility, and I'm conducting the morning safety review. Hi, I'm Jim Simpson. I'm currently operating extrusion line one, as I have for the past 23 years. My line produces the product with the fewest defects of any in the company. This job is so routine to me, I feel most days I could do it in my sleep. Well, thanks, Jim. Jim, we take the safety of our employees at this company very seriously. Are you currently aware of any safety issues or concerns in your production area? Nope, none at all. After my last accident, when I tripped over a box of raw materials left in my work area, I know the importance of safety. I missed three months of work and I still have trouble with my ankle due to that injury. Well, Jim, can you describe the safety features of this production line in your work process? Sure. I walk this line about 53 times each day to ensure the product is being produced in the highest quality. So, you have to pay close attention to the line and keep your eyes on the product at all times, correct? Yes, I cannot keep my eyes off the line. My feet have to do the walking and guide me. My eyes have to remain focused on the product to ensure it is finished and ready to go. So does this mean that there can't be any obstacles in the way that could cause you to trip or fall? Exactly. If I were to slip, trip, or fall, it could be disastrous. There are many moving parts in the area, and it is important the path remains unobstructed. Jim, do you perform a pre-shift safety inspection? No, I rely on the guy from the third shift to lead the area better than he found it. I always ensure the area is safe for the next guy, and I trust the same is done for me. Jim, will you walk this line with me? Let's observe the area to ensure there are no obstacles in the way. I'd be happy to. Jim, do you see any obstacles or trip hazards in your way? Only the electrical cable running under the extrusion line. But didn't you say earlier that you walked this line about 53 times a day? Yes, sir. Sometimes as many as 65. Did you say you have to keep your eyes on the line and can't focus on the floor? Your feet have to walk for you? Yeah, that's right. Jim, do you think this electrical cable presents a tripping hazard for you? Yes, I do. How many opportunities do you think are presented for you to trip over this cord? About 53, sometimes 65. So Jim, there's up to 65 opportunities for you to trip over this cable each day. Yep. Jim, do you have any recommendations to eliminate this hazard? Why have you not notified me? Well, you're a very busy man. But yes, I should have completed a pre-shift inspection instead of trusting the guy before me. Second, I should notify you and identify a means to redirect the cable. If opportunities do not exist, we need to properly secure it by taping it down and marking it to prevent trip hazards. So that I understand, you are to always conduct a pre-shift inspection. Notify me of any safety hazards, regardless of how busy you think I am. Identify alternative solutions. And if none exists, we need to make sure the hazard is properly contained to eliminate any injury. Is that correct? Yes. Jim, let's practice this pre-shift inspection, then explore alternative options. And lastly, look for ways to properly secure the hazard. So a few things to think about in the last exchange. First, how did Sam approach Jim? Second, how did Sam interact with Jim? Third, how did Sam ensure Jim understood the proper procedure? And last, how did Sam ensure he understood what Jim was telling him and clarify for understanding? Our next case study involves proper PPE. Seth Jennings, the night supervisor, is on the production floor and close to the end of the shift. He notices Ryan Brown, a new cutter, is working quickly to complete the final cuts on the day's last production. Ryan has been with the organization for three years and is a model employee. He's been a safety champion and was recently promoted to this role. Upon closer observation by Seth, he notices Ryan is not wearing eye protection at the cutting station. Immediately, he walks over to Ryan and motions for him to cease operation. Ryan secures his area and walks over to Seth. Let's take a look at Seth's approach with Ryan. Hi, I'm Seth Jennings, the night supervisor. Hi, I'm Ryan Brown, 
I am finishing the final cuts of the day prior to the end of the shift. I am trying to go home in time and take my kids to school. Ryan, how long have you been in this role? I was recently promoted and love it. Ryan, do you mind demonstrating the process and the safe operating procedures? Not at all. First, the material is fed through this line. I lower the saw to ensure a complete cut and then transfer the finished piece to the finished area for processing. I repeat this process over 300 times per shift. Ryan, do you mind telling me about the safe operating procedures? I'm required to observe all safe operating procedures of the saw, ensure my hands are free from the cutting area, wear category five cut resistant gloves, and lower the guard while cutting. It is the safest procedure in our facility. Ryan, are there any other safety guidelines or procedures? I complete a pre-shift inspection and do follow-ups after break and between each new load. Ryan, what do you do if you identify hazards? I notify maintenance and operations are ceased until we both have confirmed the equipment is operating properly. Ryan, I appreciate your attention to the safe operations, but are you required to wear any personal protective equipment while operating the saw? Yes, sir. As I said earlier, I'm required to wear category five cut resistant gloves. I see. What about hearing and eye protection? Is it required? Yes, sir. I wear them all. Right now is an exception. My eye protection broke a few cuts ago. A piece of aluminum flew up and hit me in the eye and broke my glasses. I only have a few cuts left, and it's the end of the shift. I did not waste time by shutting everything down walking across the facility to get a new pair. I see. Ryan, how many cuts did you say you have left? Only a few. How many cuts do you think you would have to make for a piece of aluminum to fly up and hit you in the eye like earlier? Only one. Ryan, do you believe with only a few cuts left, you could have a similar accident? Well, yes, sir. I was just trying to finish my job and get home to take my kids to school. I never planned on having an accident. Ryan, if a piece of aluminum hit your eye, how serious do you think the injury would be without eye protection? Severe. It could even lead to me losing my eyesight. So only one cut could lead to a piece of aluminum hitting you in the eye and potentially result in losing your eyesight? Yes, sir. Ryan, what do you believe you should do if this occurs again? Well, I should stop the job and get replacement eye protection. So just to confirm, you should stop the job and replace eye protection before completing another step? Yes, sir. So a couple things to think about. How did Seth approach Ryan? How did Seth interact with Ryan? How did Seth ensure Ryan understood the proper procedure? And finally, how did Seth ensure he understood what Ryan was telling him and clarify for understanding? <laughs>